the time of writing, it's been just over three weeks since Bernie Sanders won the Iowa caucus. It's been exactly three weeks since the Financial Times published James Carville's article entitled Hey Democrats, It's the Winning Stupid, parodying a phrase he coined when he was last relevant 28 years ago. Just over 10 years before that though, and Ronald Reagan had just ousted the Democrats from the White House, and with them, a period in US and European history that is often referred to as social democracy. Reagan didn't merely bring the Republicans or the conservative element of US politics to the White House. His doctrine, paralleled by Margaret Thatcher's in the UK, set in motion successive rounds of policy agendas implemented with the result of turning social democracies and their welfare systems around. This not only meant undermining the position of workers in relation to capital in our society, allowing the great inequalities we have today, it also instituted a new common sense that bred suspicion of anyone in receipt of welfare support, dissolving social bonds of solidarity and community and replacing these with extreme competition, transaction-based relations and situating the marketplace as a solve-all. And when Bill Clinton in turn ousted the Republicans with the aid of Carville, a peculiar thing happened, which again was paralleled in the UK a few years later when Tony Blair brought Labour to power. Both Democrat and Labour governments of the 90s, having seized the opportunity to undo Reagan and Thatcher's neoliberal policies, seemed instead to adopt them. Becoming cliched at this stage, but when Thatcher was asked what her greatest achievement was, she responded, New Labour. This response signals that a faction had taken over the Labour Party, and it eventually began to lose. Not when David Cameron came to power, however, but when Cameron's project fell off the rails after he promised and was held to task over a referendum to leave the EU. The same again happened in the US when Donald Trump somehow managed to become leader of the Republican Party and then the US President. The ideological driven faction that had taken over both Labour and Conservative Party, both the Democrats and the Republican Party, both the US and the UK governments, among many others since the 80s, has, in the last few years, reached its limits with the electorate. And according to Carville in his article, Political parties do not exist for factions to gain power over them and lose elections so long as the faction maintains its grip. They exist to win elections. Despite having now reached this limit, this faction had not lost an election in the US or UK for the guts of four consecutive decades. It would appear then that Carville is incorrect as it seems that, irrespective of the faction, a party is prone to winning or losing elections. If a party could determine what faction will win an election beforehand, then there would be no need for a selection process. That was Carville's first paragraph. His second focuses on a quote by Sanders who told the House Democrat caucus that the goal is not to win elections. Leaving aside for a moment that this quote is presented in so rudely a dismembered form, the point Carville hopes to emphasise here is that all that matters right now is winning this election. This, presumably, is to suggest that Democrats should be doing all in their power to present a safe, centrist candidate that will appeal across the board of the US electorate. The primary focus is to forego the consideration of policy. Instead, the candidate's manifesto for the White House should be watered down to meet the needs of that broad electorate. Striving to appeal to such a broad consensus on the road to power sounds like some sort of democracy, to be fair. However, if this is the strategy mainstream political parties are to take, then what is left to distinguish them from one another? And if the left and right of mainstream politics converges in such a manner by way of focusing solely on winning elections, then how are diverse and conflicting social positions expressed and represented? And, if this carry-on continues for, say, the best part of 40 years, what happens to the ingrained suppression of that will to express such social differences? If one was to hazard a guess, they might conclude that eventually the depth of suppression of such a will to express political differences would result in a compounded pressure that will naturally seek alternative avenues of expression, thus leading to a force with a destabilising effect on that status quo, causing ruptures in society, such as the bizarre attempt to steer a nation state toward greater sovereignty by giving up its seat at the table with other regional powers. The strategy of winning elections at all costs makes sense only when you see the field of power in an apolitical frame. It is only natural that, after consigning most of society to the private apolitical realm, the winners of industrial capitalism who instituted parliamentary democratic politics as an empty concession to what was left of the aristocracy as well as the mounting body of workers would eventually return to eradicate that remaining sliver of popular sovereignty. And in neoliberalism we see such a faction. Politics, over the last 40 years, has been emptied of its contents, replaced with what we were told was a pragmatic compromise between the left and the right, a third way, and capitalism with a smile. 
So it would appear then, and particularly in the face of that desperate need to win this election, that the Democrats need to offer an authentic alternative to both the centre, whose apolitical ideology has led to this mess, and the far right, who have been consolidating gradual but great gains in our society once more. Strikingly, the extended Sanders quote butchered by Carville above is as follows. The goal isn't to win elections, it is to transform America. What is the point in winning an election if you don't have a mandate to enact policies that meet the political needs of your constituents? As above, a strategy solely focused on winning elections activates a filter that disincentivizes a party from providing a political alternative. And while it is true the centrist faction does offer a genuine alternative to the likes of Trump and Nigel Farage, the latter's success in the past few years is based on the former's ideological failing in dealing with the accumulation of unmet social needs. Their third way has failed. The economic system is conserved tumbled like a series of overpriced houses made of card, destroying the lives of tens of thousands and the livelihoods of millions, the faction's response to which was then to make those who suffered the most pay for the cost of the damages. People deserve an alternative, and that is precisely what political parties exist for. Carville, then, is wrong in identifying only one moral imperative. The next Democratic presidential candidate not only has to defeat Trump, they must also provide an alternative to 40 years of political suppression and cynical economic conservatism by this centrist faction. The mistake that faction is making is to believe that the far right represents the disruptive factor in the field of their vision for society. The dispersion among the electorate to right or left extremes is not due to the spontaneous appearance of alternatives to their vision. Those alternatives and their appeal are a result of that faction's grip on politics. They are merely failing to recognise that the disruptive factor causing this dispersion is their role in determining what politics is supposed to look like in our society. Carville's painting of political alternatives to his own as extreme is a disingenuous attempt to play on the democratic field and conceal the legitimate democratic expression that those alternatives represent. He's not cheating, but it's not honest. When he speaks about the choice Democrats face, it's not between an ideological cult and a reasonable and sensible, normal, everyday, friendly neighbourhood politician. It's between two ideological cults, if we must use the term, that will inevitably alienate large swaths of the public. That is what political parties exist for, embodying different perspectives in a political field, a field where people can negotiate their differences without having to resort to destroying each other. They do not exist to become one homogenous apolitical grouping with a neatly woven consensus. That was tried in the 20th century. Indeed, the Soviet Union collapsed under the weight of heterogeneity and the Chinese Communist Party adapted to allow for it. Consensus on that level is impossible, and attempts to conceal difference, heterogeneity and dissent amounts to suppression. There does not need to be militarised police presence in the streets for this to be considered violent, though that tends to happen too. Regardless, as outlined previously, suppression eventually amounts to rupture. Hence Trump. Hence Farage. Carville is correct about one thing. Democracy is indeed on life support. In order that it be resuscitated, however, we need to see past this disingenuous centrist cult and its rhetoric, determine our options independently, and then vote for them democratically. We need real alternatives and the chance to express our impulse to social division before its suppression spills over from the political into the social and we end up tearing our society to shreds. Oh, and one more thing. Describing these ongoing primaries and their inclination towards the farthest left candidate as a rat race is interesting given the candidate at the farthest left. I hope Carvel's slip of the tongue here alludes to the Freudian case of rat equals penis and not something darker.